Marx wrote a lot of books. A lot of other Marxists and non-Marxist socialists wrote a lot of books back in the last century. While the socialists, while you socialists were writing thousands and thousands of books, we over here were doing nothing. I've often asked people to name a book or an author, uh, an author writing in the field that we're dealing with today, a book written between 1850 and 1935 that you can read today with profit. Oh, I'll give you Herbert Spencer. Mill comes into this period, although he began to be a socialist toward this part of his life. William Graham Sumner up at Yale. John W. Burgess, who was a professor at Columbia, taught Theodore Roosevelt. And then he began to stutter. What other books are there? Until 1935, when Albert J. Nock, whom I mentioned, wrote a little book of political theory, which the Nockian Society, which operates uh, off a corner of my desk at Irvington, we published, a, a, we reissued two of Nock's books last uh, June, Our Enemy the State, by which he did not mean our enemy government, by the state he meant, well, the operation that I mentioned of Iacocca and Chrysler, Iacocca became part of the state with that operation. A private citizen in cahoots with some politician to wrongfully dip into the tax fund to use political power was the state. In 1937, Walter Lippmann wrote a very good book called The Good Society. Still worth reading. Lippmann is kind of an on-again, off-again writer. I've often said that if he were in baseball, he'd be called a switch hitter. He can, write, uh, can, he can bat to left field or to right field almost at will. But the good society I recommend. Since the end of World War II, our side has produced book after book after book. We have a whole big shelf of books. The foundation has a partial library here, but we have 125 or so titles in our catalog. I counted them one day several years ago, and I was quite surprised to note that only a handful had been written before 1945. We had Adam Smith, Edmund Burke for the 18th century, the Federalist Papers for the 18th century, had one little book of John Stuart Mill, something by Herbert Spencer, something by Bastia, the Frenchman, but seven or eight books written before 1945. All the rest had been written and published since the end of World War II, which is why I say we are gaining. And however long it'll take for these ideas to have political repercussions, I don't know. They're having some right now. Mr. Goldwater sort of paved the way in 1964, but there wasn't a sufficient backing in the country. There was to elect Mr. Reagan. I checked after the election. Ronald Reagan had been on the foundation mailing list to, uh, since 1961. He came to a remnant luncheon that I held out in Los Angeles back in about 1964, where Leonard Reed was the speaker. So we met him then when he was with uh, GE as a spokesman. Later went to Sacramento and then to Washington. So there was something that happened between Mr. Goldwater and Mr. Reagan to provide a sufficient number of votes to elect uh, Ronald Reagan. There had been a growing discontent with government Remember back in the days when Jimmy Carter ran against Gerald Ford? Both were inveighing against the overgrown bureaucracy in Washington. Not that they did much about it, or anybody did much about it, but uh, they dealt with popular discontent. Almost everybody feels that there's something wrong with the way things are politically. However, you have a moral issue then, because a lot of people are benefiting from the wrong things government does how to give up your benefits, uh, which is required if you want to get government back within bounds. How to do that is a moral judgment. I ought to do it because it's the right thing to do, even though it might cost me a few bucks. So it's, at some point in the future, I think the norms will be restored because every person wants maximum freedom to pursue the goals he or she has cho chosen. Everyone, without exception. Even the most evil person you can imagine, a tyrant composed of Idi Amin, Stalin, Hitler, Mao, and some others, wants to be free, or that is unimpeded, to pursue his goal, which is to extinguish freedom. But the moral thing is to say, 
I want as much freedom for everybody else to pursue his or her goals as I demand for myself to pursue mine. That was the idea of the old-fashioned Whigs. Didn't talk just about freedom, but about equal freedom or equal liberty or liberty and justice for all. Or Adam Smith spoke of his plan, plan of liberty, equality, and justice. So there are moral issues interwoven with this recovery of personal freedom and a free society. When it'll occur, I don't know. Huh? Michael Jensen, a professor of economics at the University of Rochester, is also the editor of the Journal of Financial Economics. I've read his papers for a number of years. Recently, he made a rather radical statement that I'd like to comment on, and he called for the complete elimination of the legislative branch of government. He said nothing about the executive branch. I suppose um, he would say judge-made law would be sufficient for all the purposes now served by the legislature or by legislatures. I'm not competent to argue the details of that. I think that any movement set afoot today to abolish our tripartite structure, to abolish the legislature, would have insuperable difficulties in its way. I would like to see all branches of government serving the true end of government, which Madison said is justice, uh, to secure justice between person and person. Justice, he said, is the end of civil society, the end of government. Let the government be oriented toward protecting the life, liberty, and property of all persons. You would have a just society. I think this is a fairly clear-cut goal. Our forebears did establish that in large measure what they have done, we can do again. I'm prepared, if I had you know, the inclination, to uh, think of Mr. Jensen's proposal or talk it over with people who know more about it than I do, but I, I have no expert opinion on it. I know that Rochester has some awfully good people in the Department of Economics. I don't know uh, Michael Jensen, but Bruner. I'm not sure what Alan Wallace is doing up there, fine economist. He was the president and chancellor for a while, also a member of our board at the foundation. Great school. I have to ask somebody else. Yes, sir. I've been down on the word democracy for years, uh, equating it to mobocracy, trying to point out to people that we were not a democracy, and Kuyper says that the democracy can never exist as a permanent form of government. Now, you raised uh, an interesting point. You're, you're suggesting perhaps the word's okay if it's just limited to describe, if it's just an adjective describing the way you vote and what Correct. you vote. Correct. Yes. Is that your point? Right. As the word is used today, we have to be against it. It is used by people who don't believe in it. I mean, the intellectual elite of our time do not believe in the wisdom of the average man. They scorn the average person. I think the average person is a poor boob who has to be led around. Uh, they want to be the leaders, and they know that the word democracy has acquired certain holy overtones. So they use the term democracy, I think, hypocritically. But there was a proper use for it. It was used properly at one point. I have a book called Democracy Versus Socialism, written about 1899 by an Australian. And democracy in that title means about the same as individualism or individual liberty. Uh, not a particularly good use of the word, but uh, that's what the word did mean for a lot of people uh, 100 years ago, say, or 80 years ago. But as it is used today, the idea of uh, plebiscitary democracy uh, or participatory democracy, it's a sham idea and a fake use of the words, I believe. Huh? And, uh, you have to start with that. Yeah. No question about it. Mm-hmm.
impossible to think properly if uh, words are distorted or warped or fuzzy, or if you can say that words are something like a marked deck of cards. If they get us to play with their marked deck of cards, they're going to win the game. And we shouldn't play their game. Uh, the idea of individual responsibility or self-responsibility is a key idea. Again, the, uh, one of the major intellectual thrusts of the past several hundred years has been that the human person is simply the product of environmental factors over which he had no control. His character, I'll quote the whole thing this afternoon, but Robert Owen uh, said that a man's character is made not by him, but for him. This is the basic premise of socialism, the idea that, uh, well, we observe that the human being is making a botch of his life on this planet. He is a product of his circumstances, of his environment. Let's us gain control of his social environment, and if we can control the society, we can reshape a new humanity because humanity is simply a product of its environment. Give us the environment, we'll produce a new humanity. We'll do the job as God should have done it, except he lacked the funds. <laughs> have we about run dry? I guess so. Why don't we call it quits and have a, whatever you have in mind for us, Dick. Let me take care of a little housekeeping. We have some cords on the floor, and I'd caution you to be careful as you traverse back and forth. Uh, we've got them taped down, but we don't certainly want anyone injured. Ed mentioned the book table, which you'll find out in the hall. And during the break, and the, uh, the, the break coming up, and subsequent breaks, and during lunch, please visit the book table. Uh, if, uh, if you find a book there or a title, and I'm sure you will, that uh, might uh, pique the interest of someone who couldn't be here today, why not acquire the book? Make uh, him or her a present of it. Uh, because as Ed has indicated, and I think as we all know, it is an educational process. Uh, we will win this battle, but it will take, uh, it will take uh, our reaching others in meaningful ways. Um, Ed, uh, I want to just ask you one question, if I could, from the podium. You indicated that under sortilege, uh, the loser becomes the judge. Is that correct? I said that. I'm not sure this is so. But well, I, we, 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 the means are different, but the effect today is unfortunately very close to the same. Uh, we uh, have the same result. Many of the folks on the bench today, I guess in terms of free market thought, would consider to be, are considered to be losers. Um, one quick final editorial comment, then I'll turn you loose for the break, but um, it's interesting to me to note that uh, our priorities in this society are, are, are spoken of eloquently by the signs that we, uh, we have uh, posted about us. Uh, Corey and I came out this, yesterday to determine whether we could get the fee seminar published on the uh, signboard out front here, and it was brought to our attention that the racquetball tournament has top billing. So our, our fee seminar sign is on the reverse side. Uh, you'll notice not the, not the uh, most conspicuous portion of the sign. And coming, in, uh, coming into Atlanta from uh, the south side of town on I-7585, there's a sign that I think tells, us, tells a story. Uh, the sign contains two words stadium and capital. Stadium's on top. It says a lot about us as a people. Um, please be back at 11 o'clock. Thank you.